Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org. We continue our podcasts about the war which Russia started against Ukraine. This series is brought to you by Internews Ukraine and Ukraine Crisis Media Center, two Ukrainian media NGOs. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm editor-in-chief of ukraineworld.org. We are making this podcast with Tatyana Harkova, who is in charge of international outreach at Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Hello, Tanya. Hello. Before we start, let me remind you that you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ukraine World. Today we decided to talk, uh, to continue our background talks, because we're not only talking about what's going on with this Rus- Russian invasion, but we also try to give you a little, a little bit of background, including of cultural background. And today we decided to talk about r- the mysterious Russian soul, um, a, a very kind of a popular maybe idiom, in Russia itself, and maybe in the West uh, as well. So this admiration for Russian culture, this uh, admiration for irrationality of Russian culture, which uh, in our view is not very much critically perceived in the world. So why this admiration for Russian soul exists, for example, in Europe or partly in America? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Let's start stating that it really exists. So what we observed during our stay in many European countries, this is a kind of attraction for for Russians and for Russian culture, for this alterity of Russians, of the difference from Europeans. And there are may, uh, many major uh, explanations why it's happening. So we do know in, it's, our work is linked to, our spe- specificity of our work is linked to the fact that we are communicating with people close to uh, who are uh, who approve the kind of admiration for Russian culture, and I would say that maybe this is something exotic in Russia which attracts people on many many different levels, starting from the geography. Let's say, talk about this because Russia is a huge country, and uh, we know many Europeans who are attracted by this geography, by, for example. Uh, Siberia and all these long seven days long travels to Siberia so this is something something really huge when you look at Europe you have a lot of different but compared to Russia small countries so with borders here yeah, with borders so when they look at Russia they see this immense territory really huge one uh, and without many people, in fact. So it, when you move out from Moscow and out from big cities, you have this huge space. So there's something uh, that really is d- different from what what people know in in Europe. So Europe the- is centered around cities. Let's not yeah. forget. So it's it's a basically a culture of polis. You know the the, the yeah, ancient Greek polis. Greek polis, the communication between different communities. In Russia, you don't have real cities. You probably have, okay, you you have Moscow, you have probably the ancient cities of Novgorod, something else. And this, this can be explained why with this fanatism with which Peter I was constructing St. Petersburg. He was trying really to build a European city with European mm-hmm. architecture yeah. in you know inside Russia. Yeah, and and, and 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 in Russia they are attracted by this notion, by this perception of space. So you just by this nature, and uh, you can add here these uh, low temperatures in winter, all these severe climate. You know, it's also very much different from European. So with snow, with frost, with all that kind of things. So this the, is the this Nordic is, culture. Uh, this, this is a kind of kind of exotic culture for 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 them and uh, I think that this this idea of uh, what you what you mentioned uh, what you mentioned uh, wideness we all remember from the Soviet Soviet childhood we remember the song Shira, uh, Shira Maya Radna. Mm-hmm. our land is so wide you mm-hmm. know it's really this immense space and I think uh, this is very important. The, the there is also expression "shiroka uh, ruskaya <coughs> dusha," meaning the wide Russian soul. <coughs> I think this idea of wideness is very important because it contained itself one of the key traits of Russian political culture, not only political culture. It's uh, the the blindness towards borders. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, unwillingness to note borders between countries, between individuals, between things, between phenomena, between everything. So I think that while the 
Western European culture was so much focused on this idea of distinction, distinction, yeah, and uh, this coming coming from Aristoteles, coming from the uh, Plato dialectics, then coming through the medieval culture, the um, the scholasticism, uh, th- this ver- this very you know long work on the art of distinction. I would yeah. call it in this way, the art of distinction, the conceptual distinction, the con- the, the, the legal distinctions, the le- distinctions between uh, cities, uh, between individuals, etc. R- Russian culture, in, especially in the nineteenth century after the Roma- romanticism, it was like pushing towards the idea that you are too much on the distinction side and we are in this wideness of um, no borders crossing the borders, indistinguishable something, right? It comes from this empire image of Russia, but um, let's add here this communist communist ideology of crossing the border. We were talking about about international communism. So Russia was the center of this international communism, which has to be spread everywhere in the world. So this is this dislike of borders of distinguish d- d- distinguishing between borders is something very very proper to Russia. And um, now, after Soviet time, after communist ideology, they still keep this idea of no borders by violating borders and frontiers of other countries. We've seen that in Transnistria, in Georgia, and later in Ukraine. So this is something, this is a living empire, and they cannot imagine themselves being like... uh, uh, like in prison in their territory, even if their territory is much bigger than any any other country in Europe. So this wideness, so this link to nature, this link to this mysterious nature, this severe nature with snow, with everything. So it makes this alterity which attracted Europe um, for many centuries already, and we still see the consequences. Yeah, it, it, it attracted Europe, but let's be serious. I mean, this kind of idea that there is an um, alternative to this rational Europe, which is distinguishing everything and uh, which is too rational. I mean, this existed in throughout the 19th century. We can talk about Polish Romanticism, which have seen itself as a kind of alternative to this Germanic spirit or whatever. We can talk about also the, the Ger- German Romanticism, of the early 19th century, which was also thinking in these terms of indistinguishable, mm-hmm. or of this, what what Germans were calling like the Weltseele, the world soul, uh, or something that really ac- accomplishes everything and, and combines everything in itself. The German Romanticism was very much anti, anti-British, anti, anti-French, anti-rational, but uh, all these cultures ca- kind of are uh, going through very, you know, difficult situations, especially if we talk about Germany. It seems to me that they have always had this another kind of, an, a, another, another, another side, mm-hmm. the rational side, the enlightenment side, w- which was always neutralizing, I would say, this, this going into the mysticism, into the undistinguishable uh, into the this uh, disgust for borders etc so it was it was ba- in in german cons- uh, culture it's it's really the balancing i mean between let's say kant and wagner right if uh, to put it bluntly and but in russia th- if you, if you if you look closely to russia you will see that this is a kind of metaphysical culture so what they what they put in front of their culture is like a metaphysical maybe mystical even culture and the the, the whole attraction who comes to to Russia, it could be explained from this point of view. Uh, Europe, which is rational, which tries to make rules and borders, is attracted by this alterity, by this difference, you know. And this romanticism you were speaking about, yeah, it, it was different in, in, in European cal- cultures, but in Russia, it, 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 it is constant, constant metaphysical component of their culture, and, attracting... And there is no enlightenment balancing of it. So I would say that a, a sound culture, which is not not ill, right? It, it is always balancing. It, it, uh, well, yeah. if we look at the French culture, you have Descartes, but you have Baudelaire, for mm-hmm. example, and they're balancing each other. The, the mysticism of Baudelaire uh, and, and playing, you know, on the, on the, on the moral borders and, and thinking how to trans, transcend them, transgress them. And, and on the other, 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 other side, there is Descartes and this French rationalism. The same we can, we can, we can say about 
English British culture maybe because you have the British empiricism but then you have William Blake and and, and those mysticisms and the same of course about Germans uh, who had the you know <laughs> Wagner who had the Meister Eckhart uh, had the many uh, mystical and even Hegel but that they have Kant and they have this enlightenment tradition the same we can t- uh, say about Ukraine and that's the, the that's the peculiar thing about Ukrainian culture because we also have these romantics this exaltic poets like you know, right of course Taras Shevchenko right but if you look at the pantheon of Ukrainian writers you will always have the balancing figure of Ivan Franko coming from Galicia and uh, basically very much in, ra- in, in you know in rooted into the european very rational culture mm-hmm. i would even say positivist culture mm-hmm. so uh, ivan franko is a, is a, is an example how you become a writer be, uh, being at the same time a scientist a researcher um the same we can say actually about for example one of our key philosophers mikhail drahomanov also a teacher of, of franko is He's a posit- positivist, so he's yeah, a, a yeah. real, a r- very rational figure, a uh, very mm, positivist figure, where, very science-focused figure. We don't have this in, in Russian culture. We don't have these uh, heroes from the rational and, and positivist side. Yeah, and the explanation, in, uh, I think, is that uh, in this Enlightenment project, Russia was not inventing something new. She, it was it was approaching Europe. So when Peter the first started this uh, this modernization project in Russia, it was idea to approach the Western civilization. So, but they don't have their own tradition of this rational thinking, of this uh, normality in a way, you know. So, and it, paradoxically, this attracts attract the, any kind of reaction in Europe because they are really different and really not balanced. Uh, Speaking about Ukrainian culture, it is also gender balanced because in our pantheon you, you, we have a lot of women, starting from Lesia Ukrainka, but m- many others, Olga Kobylanska. So we all we have all this pluralism of of voices, of faces, etc. But in Russia, you have only these metaphysical depths, you know, all this uh, tragedy, and it it. Paradoxically, it, it, it attracts attention and even admiration because when Europeans are tired of their own tradition, and it happens, um, ma- it happened many times in history, they look up to the East and they, they, fa- they find these new countries, these different countries, this different approach, these different people, uh, wild problem- people. And, and their attraction is also linked to their, not only to their wideness, but also to their wildness. You know, the, the fact that they are not civilized they are different. They are this, I don't know, this close to nature source. It comes from this close to nature source. And in, in many descriptions, you can read this admiration for, for Russian culture and for Russian muzik. So peasants and all these, all these figures, you know, with uh, an incredible, incredible uh, metaphysical soul. This is because it comes from from not civilization so from because it's too far from civilization it's too far from european culture and it explains this uh, attraction to it i guess and the problem is that for western intellectuals this opening up to the to to this you know metaphysical depth or madness of Russian culture is an example of critical thinking. They're saying, well, we are not that naive with regard to our culture. We are critical thinkers. We're going beyond our culture. But the problem is, is that it is anyway too much West-centered. Even if it goes beyond looking for the otherness, uh, it is probably critical towards its own culture, but it's not critical towards this culture to which it approaches. And that's what, what we Ukrainians are reproaching to this Western admiration of the Russian soul, because basically what these intellectuals, writers, journalists, politicians think and the self-critical approach to, to yourself is basically incredible naivete, incredible blindness, because basically you, you don't really, you're not really interested in, in analyzing this, the other. You are just uh, creating another, another naivete uh, and another construct of your own psychological, I would say, psychological problems. Uh, that's it, yeah, that's it, in fact. So you are not critical about Russian tradition. You're just I- attracted, you just admire this culture, and that that's it. But, uh, and 
I, I like the word blindness, blindness about Russia, because what comes together, let's talk about what comes together with this, uh, with idea of immense space, uh, with empire, without any borders, what comes together with this idea of wild, wild nation, not rational, etc., etc., we we already seen what's happening what comes together all these uh, all this destruction all these uh, death the cult of death everywhere where they put uh, with, where, everywhere where they are present and all these things comes together with it yes and <clears throat> let's let's analyze some cult uh, you know very popular <clears throat> russian literature for example products let's 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 look at them uh, for example, I am uh, uh, some, I think, 20 years ago, I was reading very much uh, a writer called Mereshkovsky, Dmitry Mereshkovsky. He was immensely popular in Europe in early 20th century. Uh, when the Bolshevik came, he, he rejected Bolshevism, then immigrated to, to France, where he already had apartment because he was immensely popular writer at the time. And, and contrary to many other white emigres from Russia, he was rich enough to have an apartment in France. And then he was, uh, he hated Bolsheviks so much that he kind of a misregarded uh, the other evil which was coming, the evil of fascism. So he was writing letters to Mussolini, and I, th I think he was even proud that Mussolini, uh, he, he, he had a, a rendezvous, personal rendezvous with Mussolini, etc. So uh, we can we can kind of Look at those generation of early 20th century, people who left uh, Bolshevik Russia in the 1910s, 1920s, uh, people like Ivan Ilyin, uh, who is uh, very well analyzed by Timothy Snyder in one of his books. But I would, I, would, I would talk about Mereshkovsky. What you basically, what, you, what is interesting and what is important about all his novels is, is basically that he just erases the differences. He erases the distinctions. He always put the question whether it's black or white. So in the end, any of his historical novels, you, you, just, you, you just can't understand anymore what, what, whether you can draw a difference between a evil and, and good, between black and white, be, between good deeds and bad deeds. This is kind of a, this moral criticism which, which has come to its to its end, where basically you are, you are, you are unable to distinguish. Mm -hmm. And if you are unable to distinguish between good and bad, if you are, if you're thinking this in this regime that it, it's so much complicated, that uh, it, it is so complicated that you can d dig deeper and deeper and deeper in a in every good act, you can see some evil psychological problems, and you, if, in the bad acts, you can you can see some good things. You're just losing the orientation. Yeah, and just 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 the lack of these moral judgments, you know. And the same thing you can observe in Dostoevsky, starting from crime and punishment. So what crime and punishment is about? It's about Raskolnikov who killing this old lady, and that's it. And so uh, two and old ladies. Two, the, and where is the punishment? So the punishment is not 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 uh, described in, in this novel. Uh, and there is a lot of a lot of admiration for Dostoevsky in 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 the West and in in any culture, European culture. Why? Because he's also making the thing compared to to what Mirishkovsky uh, was doing. So he's trying to show that there are so many um, little differences between between crime be, 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 between a criminal and between a saint. You know. For example, Sonichka Marmeladova, so it's this female character of the novel, so she was a um, prostitute, but at the same time she was a, a saint. So confusing, you know, confusing things in one character, you know, just taking the, the lowest and the, the highest, you know, characteristics of a personality in one, you know, this uh, has the same objective. So without any any distinctions and without any... Uh, let us say borders. So this is the same idea about no borders. So, so evil could be saint and saint could be evil. Exactly, and it, it, we don't mean that, for example, it's a bad practice for a writer to find a 
you know, female character who is prostitute and trying to analyze the good things about her. This is a topic, this is a t- typical topic yeah. for European literature at the time, at Victor Hugo, at Balzac, and um, Emile Zola, uh, uh, later, etc. But it's, it's not that point. It's the point that basically in order, and, and, and this is, we can also find it in Gorky, for example. If you want to find the good people, go where the bad people are. The, the the only the only uh, the only area w- where you find good people are where you were thinking to find bad people you know in uh, the 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 high and the low are really made interchangeable and uh, by the way this is uh, on which uh, our one of our writers that we like by the way uh, Mikhail Bakhtin a Russian philosopher of the 20th century, he made his fame out of this, you know, out of this seeing this this kind of a approach to culture when the high and the low are just inter interchangeable. But the the thing is, is that of course, uh, European culture has this element, but it very limited in time and space. What Bakhtin was trying to show, yes, there is certain time and space which is carnival, in which you can exchange the low and the high, the good and the bad, the white and the, and the, and the black. But when it, it's over, it's over. You're going back to the typical normal logic. And I think that uh, Russian culture has this feature as if it's a never-ending carnival, never-ending exchange of good and bad, uh, until the point that it becomes uh, inter- interchangeable. Yeah, uh, and in fact, then Bakhtin was inspired by European culture, by Renaissance. So he was writing about this carnival, carnival culture, and but, but by by doing so much in phases on this carnival, he was re- really thinking about this carnival exists everywhere, you know, and all the time. So there is no back to order, you know. So this is kind of uh, no order at all. So everything can be can be. Changed. And what we see now in Russian culture and Russian politics now is there is never, uh, never ending story of plural realities. So what we see now, so Russia is developing this idea of everything is possible. So, you know, you know, you act and you you are never responsible for what you are doing. So you can be could be could be not responsible for that. So any event they could present in multiple ways. So they are happening at the same time. So in in a way that audience is confused and nobody believes uh, everything. So this is a notion of truth as well. So very important in Russian language. So they are in Dostoevsky. This is a kind of a key point in Dostoevsky and developed by Bakhtin by the way, because in Russian you have distinguished the distinction between two words, istina, truth, and pravda, also truth in English. But istina is something, so is unique, unique truth, so the truth is maybe absolute truth. But what uh, Dostoevsky characters uh, were saying and what Bakhtin was telling us about Dostoevsky characters, he was telling that every personality has its own truth this ultimate absolute truth and no truth is higher than anybody others so it means that every personality every character be it uh, him or her uh, evil or good or any 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 anything he can his own truth or her own truth so uh, you cannot reduce it and you cannot sum up it to uh, to this istina so this is important and that's what bakhtin was calling Polyphony, poly, uh, no polyphony, polyphony novel in the Dostoevsky, and this is idea of mining of uh, making uh, not serious any talk about about real state of things because you it's about extreme subjectivity at the same time. It's about that you can have your opinion, your absolute truth, and me, I can have my opinion. And nobody of us is right, and nobody of us is wrong. And this is important thing in Dostoevsky, because he was a master here. He was creating really extremely persuasive characters in every of, of his novels. And here I we do trust Bakhtin, 
we describe in that with very um, very consequently and very persuasively he has these different universes you know these subjective subjectivities you know and they are always in interaction in a kind of uh, kind of um, play all the time and nobody of them is absolutely right and nobody of them is absolutely wrong and this is about the morality so when it comes to re- this is okay with, with Dostoevsky but when it comes to real life, what we see, so it, it also means for many Russians that there is no no real truth and nobody is right. And as, as and they can call fake news or fake realities, the reality, the reality where they don't win or the reality which is not okay for them, etc., etc. Yeah, and then can basically this openness to understanding everything, everybody leads you to a, a situation when you can understand the massive killer and say yes he or she has uh, her or his own universe and should be understood you know and should be really penetrated his soul should be really penetrated understood uh, have empathy sympathy etc and that's the key problem of this approach that uh, basically this is a, a total moral uh, relativism right so when russians are, are shelling the uh, railway station in kramatorsk with the missile on on which it is written for children mm-hmm. they mean that they're doing the right thing they mean that they're doing the morally right thing so they're killing children to revenge other children they supposed to be killed because of the actions of ukrainian army so back in 2014 or 15 so that's what they're doing so it just re- it's revenge and they just melt just add a lot of suffering a lot of death in today because there were some deaths before and they yeah and they they're saying that look yeah we, our actions should also be understood we have our own truths and uh, this concept of pravda it's very important it's not only dostoevsky and bakhtin it's really something that is in russian mass culture since the movie called Brat and Brat 2, Brother 2, in I think 2000, when there was a key phrase, which we I think already quoted, в чем сила брат, бра, сила в правде. So the force is in truth. This is a phrase which was repeated by Putin after the annexation of Crimea. So the, the truth, the pravda, meaning the your subjective feeling of your own rightness you know, and righteousness, which cannot be judged by anybody in the world, which doesn't have any standards to be judged. And that's horrible, because you can justify anything. And that's why Russia was explaining, starting from 90s, that the, world, the whole world is not doesn't understand Russia, because she, it has its own reasons and own destiny, and you are not understand, you don't understand what we, what we are, what we want to do. And we have our own truth about history, and what 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 what's what's happening? In fact, it's also happening rewriting history because you just don't understand these events uh, in our in our perspective. So they have their own right to to do everything with with the past, as well as with the present or future. So in a way, so let's sum it up. It's it's a dangerous it's it's a dangerous point of this and. Uh, of, of Russian culture. Yes, and <clears throat> what they're doing basically, this lack of distinction is they're approaching European or Western culture and saying, yes, what you're calling black is actually white. And what you're calling white is actually black. Look, look at how they communicate with the rest of the world. They're communicating this way. What you're calling good, we will, as we are so critical, as we are so, you know, complicated, we will just call call white. So this is kind of a, this dialectics of of their thinking. Another element, I think, this is a final element we want to stress, is the idea of extremes. Mm-hmm. I think this is also one of the elements that distinguishes Russian culture, political culture, and making it so dangerous right now. Because I think that European culture is based on, upon an idea of a, a proportion. Mm-hmm. Proportion, the correlation between different parts of a whole, uh, very long and uh, exact thinking how this correlation should be, uh, no matter I- if it's you know a sculpture or it's a, a legal act or political parties or political parties or the idea of this 
how you punish a crime. You punish a crime with a certain proportion, right? I think that Russian culture also with this kind of a disgust towards rationalism throughout all its all its movement in the 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century. Uh, disgust to rationalism, disgust to proportion, and, and an idea that an idea of extremes, you know, and when you when you look at Dostoevsky the, that you mentioned, basically what he ta- he takes a, a particular value, uh, or he takes a particular moral stance or emotion, and leads it to to the extreme. Uh, either his characters are, are either demons or saints, or angels, and sometimes <laughs> sometimes they're interchangeable, so you, you you can't really understand who is the demon, who is the saint. They he doesn't describe normal people. Yeah. He he doesn't have any idea of the norm. And that's a problem. And there's a problem because this fact it, it attracts Europeans, a lot of Europeans who are who, who find boring their own culture. They just find boring these uh, proportions, this idea that everything is balanced and there could be a balance between be, between things. So they find is this Russia, is Russian culture kind of a extreme and intense experience could it be uh, experience in art in literature i don't know in music or in politics because it's, it's an extremist culture in a way so they just don't have this milieu they just don't have this just uh, what, what's what's happening in, in 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 the center you know they just don't have this component of the culture and they uh, prefer and they uh, highlight over always all these extremes be it in politics or in, in in art or in culture, in literature, everywhere. So the, the, the European intellectual culture, Western intellectual culture in the 20th century, after the Second World War, was developing according to an idea that norm can be authoritarian, right? We all know all these, you know, French philosophers, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, etc. Their message was norm can be authoritarian. But what we understand now here in Eastern Europe is that absence of norm can be even more authoritarian or totalitarian because absence of norm is is basically saying that everything that is uh, proportional, everything which is this, what Aristotle was saying, the mesotes, the, 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 the golden middle, Everything which is uh, proportional is is bad. We should go to the extremes. But when we go to the extremes, extreme emotions, extreme actions, extreme ideas, suddenly we find ourselves in a concentration camp. Yeah, this is yeah, this is extreme cruelty at the same time. So this is a kind of extreme cruelty with this absence of moral. Uh, moral, uh, I don't know, perspective on what's going on. And maybe the last thing is to say that Russian culture, it uh, flees the reality. So another, maybe the last important thing, it is metaphysical culture, mystical culture. It, it is against reality. So it against this boredom, you know, all these norms and rules and balance. So all of what Europeans are some, sometimes tied and that's why they go to to, to Russians to see or to have all that, but um, but this um, travel, this rebellion, maybe a rebellion against reality, this is something could be extremely extremely tragic and cruel because they are denying reality of what they are doing. So they are denying the reality of things that which exist, and they are leaving behind them a kind of a desert, you know. Like I don't know, like Bucha, maybe a good symbol now. Yes. So this is our Ukrainian uh, perspective on Russia. You will probably find it biased. Well, you you have all the rights to do so. Although we analyze it since uh, many years, it's not that we just come up with these conclusions now. Uh, we have read lots of Russian literature at, at our time. We even uh, studied them academically. So, of course, we speak Russian, we read Russian. And uh, I think we have certain right right now to, to put some questions to, to the global culture because, uh, because uh, Russian culture was not approached critically, neither inside Russia nor outside Russia. And uh, I think it's time to do it because... As we try to show you, uh, show you some of the, some of the hypotheses which were developed in the European Western intellectual culture, are now should be put 
under question giving what we see right now what's going on exactly this was a podcast explaining ukraine uh, by ukraineworld.org my name is Volodymyr Yermolenko I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org Uh, I talked to Tetyana Harko, which is in charge, who is in charge of international outreach at Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Support us on patreon.com slash Ukraine World. You can listen to our podcast on SoundCloud, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast and YouTube. Stay with Ukraine and follow us.